You're not going to want to miss this episode of the AI show where we take data preparation and make it less tedious by orders of magnitude. At least orders of magnitude, sir. At I'm, least. I'm pretty excited. Make sure you tune in. Hello and welcome to this episode of the AI show where we're going to talk all about data preparation. If you saw the last episode, you saw how painful it was. Hopefully, you and you're going to make it a little bit easier for us. I'm going to make your life so much easier, Seth. You're going to pay me money. All right, let's do it. I'm ready. I got my bills right okay. now. That's what I like to hear. Okay, so last time we talked, we talked about how hard data preparation is and how frustrating and like you're kind of doing little small things that can be a little bit frustrating to, to deal with. So as part of what we announced at Ignite, we announced the Azure Machine Learning Data Prep SDK, which is an extension to Azure Machine Learning's SDK. And I'm going to walk through a couple of very simple examples here where we're going to show you how some of the things that we just did are a lot easier using that SDK. Awesome. Okay? Well, reduce my pain, my friend. It'll be my pleasure, sir as long as you pay enough money. That's right. Okay, so if you remember the last example, we read a CSV file and we read it and it failed and then we had to work out all these crazy parameters because we had to go take a look at the file to work out what was going on. I've got a better way to do that. This is a slightly different file than the last one you saw. This one's actually tougher to deal with okay. than the last one. All right, let's, and so let's I'm going see, to, I want to see it. I'm going to use this thing called a smart file read and it's going to take a second, so it's going to go off and parse the file and try and work out what's going on with the file. So now it comes back to us. And so just like I would do with any other Python data frame API, I'm just going to say, hey, show me what the, the head of this is. And here I've got a data frame. It's just the first five rows in this case. But you can see it looks like we were able to read the file pretty cleanly. In this case, we got all the columns are all aligned nicely. All right, so Seth, nobody told us you were moonlighting as a bike salesman, which oh, is what, what the data says here. The lawyers are going to get me. <laughs> AdventureWorks uh, bike sales, Seth is now working part time there because Channel right. 9 doesn't pay him enough. Mm -hmm. um, if we were to go take a look at this file, we'll go into Notepad++, this is what this file looks like. So again, we've got vertical pipe delimiters and we've got blank rows at the top. We've got a trailing record at the end that's causing confusion. All that work that we had to do by experimentation before, Smart file read. It just read it, it just looked at the file and then figured out how to do it. Yes. That's and this cool. uses something called program synthesis. I'm going to show you a little bit more of in a second. And it looks at the file and what it actually does is it writes a program to be able to read the file. Holy cow. So it's very flexible. And you'll notice I didn't even specify it was a CSV. The same API allows me to read XLSX, XLS, text files, JSON files, CSV files with multiple delimiters, multiple different encodings, and all kinds of stuff like that. That's crazy because literally, like, that part of the workflow is the worst part and the part that I probably spend the most amount of time. I got to look at the file and then on row 10,697. There's one change. There's one extra quote and that screws up the whole thing and this will go ahead and help me with that. Yeah, that's okay. right. Now, one of the challenges we face is, you know, data scientists are pretty untrusting of magic black boxes. They want to see everything in code. That's true. It's why they like to use R and Python and Scala and Spark and things like that instead mm -hmm. of using GUI tools. I just did something completely magical and they have no insight into it. Right. So one of the patterns we have in the data prep uh, SDK is we'll do the magical stuff, but if you want to see what's going on under, under the covers, you actually take a slightly longer way there and you get much more fine grained control. So we do the magic, but you can override the magic if you want to. That's so cool. let's take a look at what that would look like. Here I'm going to call the, de the detect file format method, which is actually what's being called under the covers in the method that does the smart file read. But let's go ahead and we'll just call that on the same file again, and I'm going to print what it found. And if you look down here in the bottom corner, you'll see that what it found was it found, it was a delimited file, the separator was a vertical pipe, the headers mode, that's just the way the constants are set up in Python, um, that we want a constant header in this particular case, because this file reader will also let you read across multiple files. Right, so the classic, hey, I have a bunch of files in the directory. Um, so uh, do they all have headers in them? Does only one of them have a header right. in them? Stuff like that. You can see here we picked up the skip rows. There was no quoted delimiters in this file. And so you can see all the things that we use to then generate the program that helps us read the file. That's cool. So we give you insight into the magic thing that we're doing. But we're doing magic stuff, but we're also doing things that any Python head is going to understand. If I want to take a look at the type system for what we read, because by the way, that smart file read also guesses the types for me as well. That's awesome. So now I have a bunch of floats and I have a bunch of objects. Okay, let's take a look at something that's really critical as part of the, the understanding of the process. We didn't really show it in the last show, but once I get my data in, I need to profile my data. I mm -hmm. want to run histograms. We had the whole conversation about yeah. are histograms good or evil? Mm -hmm. The answer is yes. 
And so if I want to profile the data, how do I do that? How do I develop an understanding of it? Well, I can do that right here. We have this profile object which goes off and looks at the data set and computes a bunch of information about it. And if you look over here again in the console window, That's awesome. you see a whole bunch of quick summary statistics about every single column in the data set. And it gives you different summary statistics based on whether it's a categorical or a numeric variable. Holy cow, and it even can figure out the min and the max for the email, and it's using it by alpha, alpha, alphabetical, like, alphabet. We've got some smart people on our team, Seth. I know. We're going to put you out of a job soon One if we keep day, going. One day, you know, data scientists are not going to have to think about this stuff. Yeah, we can but dream. Okay, mm -hmm. I and mean, if you take a look at this last column, this last column is a numerical column, and so we're quart computing quartiles, medians, and all kinds of stuff like that. Cool. So this is all pretty cool. So we've got that. Um, we can then make use of that even in the command line without dropping any charts out. If I go ahead here, that's what a histogram looks like as a numeric thing rather than as a pretty picture. You want to visualize that? Great, you can go ahead and visualize it. You can also call any of your favorite histogramming mm -hmm. tools on top of it. And also we do value counts, which is a frequency table. And here you can see for the city column, there's a bunch of cities which happen to be in this data set. And you can see how many instances there are of each one. That's cool. And, and so the goal here is to try and get you exposed to statistics about the data, because statistics are scalable. If this had been a billion row data set, you and I could have gone into that little snack room that you had there, yep. consumed a fair amount of food and whatever else you have hidden in that fridge. And it still would um, be running. And it still would be running. That's right. But if I can compute the stats and then run everything off the stats, that's a lot faster to be able to do that is running off stats. Um, mm -hmm. And it's, you know, it's not perfect, but it's pretty accurate in terms of the way we work. Okay, so there was one. We talked about very specific uh, transformations which make the consumption of data easy right. earlier on. And so here's one that we have. So if we take a look at this, here we're going to go ahead and we're going to do, this time we're going to do a label encoder. So we're going to assign a numeric variable to each one of those unique instances of city in this case inside the data set. Let's go ahead and convert that explicitly into a pandas data frame, which is a method that's on here. So now I have a pandas data frame in here called df. If we go ahead and look at df and we maximize this, if you take a look here at the city label, you'll see that we that's turned cool. San Francisco into a zero, we turned San Antonio into a one, and things like that. Right? Which is exactly the kind of code that I don't want to write. Yeah, and it was one line. You've got to give us a little bit of a hint. We can't do it perfectly automatically. Sure. What's the input column? What's the output column? Bunch of default rules and you get what you want out of here. So we're moving, we're moving pretty fast through this. Okay, here I'm just going to take a, a quick sample of the data into a new data frame. And now I'm going to use the pros technology that I talked about how we used it to go ahead and read the file. But here we're going to do something much smarter. If you take a look at uh, telemetry for data prep, uh, whether you look at tools which are used or whether you're looking at people's code, we've parsed millions of notebooks and pieces of sample Python that we found um, through all sorts of various means inside Microsoft, outside Microsoft. Uh, the number one most common thing is that you're going to actually do a type conversion, which is types are always wrong. Right. The second thing is you create a derived column, which is creating a new column from data from one or more of the other columns right. in the data set. Of course. And that's just cleaning stuff up, or again, it's preparing the data for consumption, which we've talked about a couple of times already. Right. Now, some of that's pretty straightforward. We you saw it with label encoding, but some of it's pretty hard. If I want to extract a salutation from a field of data, you know, Mr., Miss, yes. Mrs., mm -hmm. There are different lengths. Sometimes there's a period in there. S you know, that's, it can be quite a tough one. It's like nuts. Sometimes the order is wrong, like last name, comma, first name, period, mister, you know. Yeah. There's all sorts of crazy stuff that, that goes on. So here we're going to use something called a builder pattern. And a builder pattern is really trying to learn something about the data and then apply that back to that main data flow. So here we're going to create a builder, which is going to create a derived column. It's going to look at the name column in this particular case, which if you remember the data set had your salutation yeah. and everything else like that in it. Great, going to create a new column called salutation. Now I could go write some string processing utility, but then it would break and it would be frustrating and stuff like that. So here, I'm going to create that builder object, but this time what I'm going to do is I'm going to give it an example. And the example is for the first row, which happens to be you. Yeah. We're going to call you a mister. I'm going to be polite to you today. Nice, thank you. Just, thank just you. for today. Just for today. So we're going to call you mister. I'm going to say, okay, I want to take Mr. Seth Juarez, and I'm going to take mister as my example of what I want my output to look like. Go generate me a program that allow, I guess you generate thousands of programs, that's what's going to happen, mm -hmm. that allows me to get from my input state to my example output state. So we'll go ahead and we'll do that right now. This is going to take a second to run. Okay, it did that, so let's open up the output window here, and now I'm just going to do a preview of what it did to the data. So now the preview is actually going to force the pull in the data, so if you take a look at that data set, that was the easy one because that's the one that I actually gave. Mm -hmm. But you'll see here that it got Kathy Harding correct, it got Cami correct, and it got the others. Now, that's pretty cool. This is a super simple example. In the next episode, I'll show a much more complex example. Right. But this is a very broadly applicable technology, this program synthesis technology. You want to deal with binning, 
on data, it can do binning intelligently. You want to deal with dates, which is the most troublesome data type which exists <laughs> oh, in data yeah, science? I know. We can deal with dates. And so numbers, strings, and also dates all have operations you can perform on them and where you can use program synthesis. Now, it is not perfect, and it will not solve every problem. But there's a whole set of cases where that was a lot simpler than sitting down writing string processing algorithms. So you mentioned that we processed a lot of files. Are we using what we've learned from processing a lot of files inside of these data preparation yeah. tools? We, we learn from feedback cases. We learn from um, data that we get uh, from processing things. You know, there's great examples. We have some great Excel processing inside of the pros team. Mm -hmm. And they use the Enron. Uh, data set, which is thousands of Excel files that were part of the Enron case, and the, their accountants did some crazy things with Excel in terms of how they laid stuff out and how the tables were and things like that. And so finding the data inside those Excel sheets is also something that this engine can be used for. Wow. Um, and so we use the Enron data set as one of the test data sets. It's kind of definitive. You have MNIST data set, mm -hmm. and you have ImageNet for images mm -hmm. and um, for character recognition and stuff like that. The, the Enron data set is regarded as one of the kind of really interesting um, Excel data sets out there to be able to use as a sample. So we'll take whatever data we can get to try and make these algorithms better over time. So there's some actual AI underneath the covers of doing data preparation. Yeah, absolutely. That's awesome. So what else you got? Okay, so uh, we'll do a couple other quick things here. I'm going to save this out. And so here I'm just going to serialize this um, to disk. So what we did here, just so we kind of are understanding what's going on, is we created a graph essentially of objects, which are a series of transformations on a pipeline. Sure. I've serialized that out to disk. And this is really cool that I'm doing all of this using um, an API here, but I mean, not everybody wants to use API. So here I'm going to use the GUI for this tool, and we're going to go ahead and we're going to open up the uh, file that we just serialized to disk. This is going to take a second. Um, and what you'll see over here on the right-hand side is this is the same data set. So here you are, you're my number one set. If you look over here on the right-hand side, we loaded the file, we parsed the file, we removed the path so we don't track the path. There was the column types being set, there was the label encoding of the city operation, and there was the derived column where we created salutation. And you can see here we actually provide a little hint to tell you what it did. We extract the first match of a camel case using regex out of name. And so I can go ahead and play around inside the GUI here and then resave this back to the serialization format, and you as a nerdy coding guy, you can party on in the code, I can party on in the GUI, and we can exchange this format, and we can build up our pipeline as we want. Now, there are some cool things you can do in a GUI that you can't do inside of an uh, uh, API very easily. So if we want to see the much maligned histogram, there's a histogram for that particular column. Um, if I want to go ahead and take a look at statistics for that column, I can take a look at those stats that we saw, the object. So here, we're just rendering all that plumbing that we built under the cover. So we'll go into the GUI in more detail in another episode, but this is one of the nice artifacts of being able to go back and forth via this object graph serialization format approach. So let's go back to Spider. And, and let me, while you're going back to Spider, let yep. me ask you this. So it, when you are saving this file out, it's called a deprep file. It yep. actually stores like the source, doesn't store the source data, but it stores the transformations from the source data into the final output. So what you get, perfect segue, it's as if we'd rehearsed it. Oh my goodness. So we have an SDK and we have a GUI here. And there's an engine which is cross-platform because the tool and the API obviously will run on Linux, Mac, and Windows. Um, the engine has a whole bunch of transformations. We talked about pros. We also have a bunch of transformations from Microsoft Research, mm -hmm. which are really cool. The ones that we built, and there's also an extension mechanism where you can put Python expressions in. If, like, if we don't have a built-in, just give us some Python. That's as cool. long as it works with data frames, it'll work it. And so we create this portable data prep definition, which is what you're looking at. But we then take that data prep representation, and it gets turned into an intermediate representation, mm -hmm. a language, if you will, which is a series of primitive operators. We then hand those primitive operators to one of two runtimes right now. The first runtime is the one we're using right now, is a scale-up runtime. This allows us to scale much better than, say, a Python or an R in terms of number of threads and memory Got we it. can use. We also stream over the data. We don't load it all into memory. So this engine and these runtimes stream data rather than loading everything into Which memory. Which makes sense. Right? So you start to get about five gigs of uh, a file or files, and most of the desktop APIs are starting to struggle. We're streaming. We'll use a few gig of working set, potentially, but we'll get all of it working over the file. So you could work over potentially data whose size is larger than your RAM. Yeah, so I have eight or 16 on this machine. I don't remember. If it's only eight, then you should send a mail to my boss, get him a new laptop, please. We should please. do that, yeah. Um, but one of the standard demo files we use has 33 gigs in it. So wow. it's, it's three times, at least three times what I have, I think I have, and at least twice what I think I should have in this particular <laughs> laptop. Um, and the other thing is, by going through this intermediate representation, 
it allows us to also generate for other targets. So the original prototype of all of this was built on top of R. So R was our runtime, but we hit performance and scale problems with both R and Python. So we switched to generating scale up via C Sharp and Core CLR. And to scale out, we generate Scala running on a Spark cluster. And that's pretty cool because if you have an intermediate representation of a series of transformations that you do over untidy data, you can, in theory, add any other target for this because, it, again, it's just an intermediate representation of transformations in a series of steps. Yep. And in fact, to prove that, if I go flip here um, to into Edge, you'll see this is us sat inside of a Databricks Spark cluster, and it's exactly the same code that you just saw. Mm -hmm. The only thing that I've changed here is I'm using an HTTPS as a way of reading the file instead of reading it off my hard drive. Right. But I could have read via HTTPS actually in my code if I'd wanted to. Um, and connect it to data on Blob Store, right. data on ADLS if I want to. I do demos locally just because it's more reliable, yeah. um, but we can connect to the cloud anytime we want to, and we'll downsample that data for you as well. And so it's, my cluster might have gone to sleep, but here you can see, I mean, literally, it's the same code. There's the smart file read. Uh, there's the dtypes call. There's the profiling call. All that code that I was just running, apart from the specific, I want pandas, specific algorithms, right? All just runs here. That's pretty cool. So this is one of the final things um, to kind of talk about very briefly is by going to this intermediate representation, now the same code you write to our data prep SDK, you want to work on pandas, you want to work locally, sorry, um, you go ahead and use it. You want to work up in Spark, go ahead and use exactly the same code. Mm -hmm. And as long as you stay away from the platform specific calls, which is not always possible, but you can always scope them down, mm -hmm. you can transport that code between the two different ones. We don't care because we're generating code on the back end that's target specific. Awesome, and this, this can be used in things like Azure Machine Learning Service as well. Yes, so this is designed, you know, we keep talking about consumption of data. This is designed to be consumed in Azure Machine Learning Services. We're doing a bunch of work with the AutoML team right now to make sure that we can get data into a really great shape to be able to run AutoML examples over the top of. Um, and so th there's a bunch of usages we can make of this. This is awesome. Uh, anything else to add finally? Where can people find this? Um, go to the Azure Machine Learning Services webpage, the same place you download the Azure Machine Learning Services SDK. The next link after that is the Data Prep SDK. Go ahead and download it, play with it, give us feedback, send us complaints, send us data that it didn't work with. We'll go fix it, we'll go get it shipped. That's awesome. Well, thanks so much for spending some time with us, buddy. Thanks so much for watching. We've been learning about how to make data preparation more sane and less taxing on your time. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. Take care.